بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم and I am seeing you once again with lecture 10 of novel 2 that is modern novel so what we are going in going to do in today's talk we are going to continue with our discussion regarding chapters and details inside we, we will also look at the list of characters and um, apart discussing all the characters minors and majors we will be doing analysis of major characters in the story um, to remind you we are doing to the lighthouse by Virginia Woolf and today we are going to cover from chapter 10 onwards all right so we were talking about Cam um, who is one kind of um, uh, those who's one of those um, extreme uh, children that the Ramsey's uh, Ramsey family has um, Cam the temper tantrum daughter or Cam the wicked uh, girl runs past almost knocking over the easel she ignores everyone who tries to get her attention Mr. Banks her father her mother. We know that Mr. Bank is a family friend who is staying there with the family um, on, on their um, village house to spend their the family is there on the village house to spend their vacations and Mr. Bank and um, Lily they both both of them are family friends who come over each year to spend time with the family during that particular uh, time in a year that is summers so what happens that Mrs. Ramsey is stressing because Minta Doyle and Paul um, Raleigh have not come back from their walk so far and she won't know if they are going to get married. Her son Andrew is with them as well. So what is, what is happening that we have another suitor here, Paul, who wants to marry Minta and they both are taking stroll outside to see if they can um, propose each other and uh, primarily the men ha men in that age um, 20th century were basically uh, they had this responsibility of proposing uh, so uh, Mrs. Ramsey is worried and rather anxious and wants to know that whether her girl get proposed or not and um, as a matter of fact she knows that her son Andrew is with the couple as well um, and uh, over here we see that James tugs on Mrs. Ramsey to remind her to continue reading. James is the little uh, boy in the family who is uh, being um, loved and uh, taken care of um, by Mrs. Ramsey all the time and she is now apart doing all these uh, physical chores and um, being busy into this mental uh, activity and taking all the anxiety of everything around she is reading a storybook to her son as well um, so by getting into these tiny details if you note them down on on your writing log later on you get to know that these will um, together make make uh, reasons for you to um, you know put your idea and perspective down for example when you talk about um, feminine side that Virginia Woolf brings forward uh, how she's carrying um, the character of Mrs. Ramsey is a, is a, is a kind of uh, powerful position that she gives to Mrs. Ramsey and uh, who is taking care of so many things uh, simultaneously and this is one of those things as she reads Mrs. Ramsey continues thinking about Minta Doyle and recalls her obligations to Minta's parents who she has nicknamed the owl and the poker Mrs. Ramsey remembers Mrs. Doyle accusing her of manipulation and now we get to know that Minta is not the f Ramsey's daughter Minta is daughter of a friend family um, who is um, apparently um, Ramsey's obligation and this makes Mrs. Ramsey recall her parents and specifically her mother who would, uh, who would um, uh, accuse Mrs. Ramsey to manipulate things 
that Mrs. Ramsey thinks about her children. She doesn't want them to get older. Basically, she thinks James is sensitive and full of promise. And she thinks very high of James. Cam is a demon of wickedness. Prue is a beautiful angel. Andrew is mathematically gifted. Nancy and Roger and, and wild creatures. And Rose is gifted with her hands. Jasper shoots birds. And she clearly never should have had so many children. Okay, um, you got us. We added that last bit. Uh, Mrs. Ramsey then carries on a mental argument with her husband over her belief that the children will never again be as happy as they are now in their childhood. We find both of these characters, Mr. and Mrs. Ram Ramsey, most of the time uh, indulged in um, opposing viewpoints and hence argumenting with each other, whether it's social affair or it's belief regarding, beliefs regarding family or politics or um, country, uh, as a matter of fact. Mrs. Ramsey's thoughts then shift to Minta Doyle again. And um, you will find Mrs. Ramsey being a clear-cut focus of Virginia Woolf as far as her strategy of this, her te narrative technique of stream of conscious is concerned. All the time you will find Ram Mrs. Ramsey, Lily or Prue. Most of the time these three are the characters who are indulged in this mental activity of jumping into their uh, times, whether it's past or present, to relate to things and to make sense of them to the readers. So again we find that um, Miss, Mrs. Ramsey uh, shifts to um, her thoughts regarding Minta Doyle and she wonders briefly if she put too much pressure on Minta to marry Paul. And we see night falls once again. Mrs. Ramsey finishes reading um, James the story about the fisherman and his wife. James turned his attention to the recently lit lighthouse and the beautiful um, uh, image that uh, Virginia Woolf portrays here is the view, is a beautiful view of the lighthouse that could be seen every night from the uh, um, place of Ra Ra Ramsey's residence. Mrs. Ramsey worries that James will forever remember not going to the lighthouse tomorrow. And this is one of Mrs. Ramsey's worry that um, we know, uh, we have been reading it, that James has a very intense desire of visiting lighthouse. But somehow, so far, this would have not been possible for the family to visit the place. And what Mrs. Ramsey is worrying about that James will forever remember this and keep this inside that he could not visit Lighthouse tomorrow or any of that tomorrows. Um, and then we see that chapter 11 starts. In chapter 11, Mrs. Ramsey continues to think about how children never forget and it's therefore important to watch what you say. This is very important philosophy that comes forward in Virginia Woolf, um, Woolf's writing. And it has a clear uh, connection and linkage with her uh, narrative technique of stream of consciousness. Um, since she makes a point that um, Mrs. Um, sh since she makes a point that in stream of consciousness, um, um, characters do not forget times, past and present, they both move side by side. And our consciousness jumps into uh, each one of these categories wherever needed. So if you apply this theory on children, um, this is the same. Uh, that means that Nothing is past, everything is present, everything is present in your mind and these two streams are flowing side by side and anything that is requirement of that spur of the moment will jump in the front of your brain. And that makes her believe that children especially do not forget anything. And since we say so many things in front of children, uh, assuming that they are 
they are young and they won't be able to remem uh, you know, remember it for a long time and they definitely forget it um, very soon. Um, since they, get, they could not get their maturity so far, we at times um, uh, reveal things in front of them. And Virginia Woolf, through her character, Mrs. Ramsey, makes her point and takes the position against this practice and says that there is nothing to forget and nothing is forgotten ever. And that is why whatever you say in front of children especially, you need to watch it out. Um, and another... Um, philosophy that cam comes forward in Virginia's writing is that uh, at times I personally feel when I'm reading her writings that she takes a position where she claims that the age, age of a person uh, changes for the people, for the external realities. For example, if I am 20 today and after two years I'll get 22, the things inside will remain same. My beliefs, my perceptions, though they grow, they grow, but they remain same and age inside me remains same. However, it has a different arbitrary understanding for the external realities for the people outside in the world maybe so they would perceive me 10 today 15 after 5 years 20 after 20 years and the expectations their behaviors will change automatically uh, you know and they will they'll be expecting me to behave in response automatically too however this is not possible the weather is inside the time inside um, does not change although it grows. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting kind of um, thing when you deep, think deep inside. Anyways, coming back to the point, despite all of Mrs. Ramsey's thinking, if we were impartial observers, this is what we would have seen, Mrs. Ramsey knits watching the lighthouse. We, and we find this another, another point, another clue um, where, um, where women, is, women are portrayed by Virginia Woolf that all the time, no matter what she's doing, whether she's thinking or she's busy into some physical activity, along that she is busy in knitting. And knitting for whom? She's knitting for the caretakers of Lighthouse. And um, her philanthropy is a point of objection for her husband too. Mrs. Ramsey stops knitting. And Mr. Ramsey looks at Mrs. Ramsey. Mrs. Ramsey takes a green shawl and goes to her husband. We know the whole sequence misses some ex explosions and, and bikini-clad babies, but this is action in a wolf novel, a serious action. All right, so what happens that beneath the surface, Mrs. Ramsey finally has a, a brother that is a moment to herself. She has no one to check up on, take care of, attend to, etc. So her real self is let loose. And just what does that real self do? Well, it becomes hypothesized by the strokes of light coming from the lighthouse, imagining that the beam of light is stroking her brain and she feels momentarily um, Aesthetic. It's so beautiful portrayal of um, a woman's um, thinking process and um, her body posture when she's busy in thinking about different kinds of um, uh, you know phenomenon, phenomena, and what kind of um, reaction, thinking reaction um, she gets into is, is is visible in in this writing and, and beautiful words by Virginia Woolf and. Uh, one good news is that uh, I've been able to download uh, a v visual um, 
um, replica of this novel and that is a movie that you will watch very soon as soon as we are done finished uh, with our discussion based on the um, on the novel and we are done uh, with our discussion regarding characters I'll take you to watch the movie and there you'll be able to watch all this what we are discussing now and you will see how beautifully things are uh, portrayed in comparison to the same things are um, you know discussed here in words so the meaning is same but the transformation of the same meaning from visual into verbal and from verbal into visual will make you cherish your understanding of this uh, beautiful work by Virginia Woolf and this makes us start chapter 12 and we see what major um, actions um, uh, Ramsay's get into in this chapter. Mr. and Mrs. Ramsay walk past the greenhouse which is beginning to get repaired but Mrs. Ramsay doesn't have the heart to tell her husband the cost 50 pounds incidentally and Mrs. Ramsay often thinks randomly on this fact. Instead, Mrs. Ramsay brings up Jasper's fondness for shooting defenseless creatures. Mr. Ramsay says that that's, that's natural and not to worry about it. Mrs. Ramsay thinks Mr. Ramsay is so sensible. Um, although at many points you will see that there is a clear dichotomy between both of these characters and most of the time they are indulged in arguing because their viewpoints are totally opposing. However, at the same time you will find Mrs. Ramsey all the time taking sides of her husband. And that is a that is one reason of for her for daughters not to be happy with her because um, they think that she's all the time defending her husband. Uh, they chat some more about Charles Tansley. Charles Tansley is, is the is the young scholar who is living with the family, um, and he wants to, Mr. Mr. Ramsey to supervise uh, uh, his thesis that he is um, writing and uh, to take his uh, instructions and take, to take his advice uh, he is living with the family during the summer uh, on their uh, stay at the village house. Prue Ramsey, Mr. Ramsey fails to see her beauty and about the garden. Um, Mr. Ramsey brings up Andrew and says that if the boy doesn't work harder he lose his scholarship. Mr. Ramsey will be proud if Andrew gets a scholarship. Mrs. Ramsey will be proud either way because she is a real fan of um, her children's God-gifted skills and um, any worldly acknowledgement such as a scholarship does not affect her affection and love for her children um, as big as it would do for Mr. Ramsey. They seem to like this balance in each other and maybe this contradiction keeps them um, a potential companion for each other. If they, would have, if they both would have been alike, um, things would have not been as perfect as they look like in the story. Mrs. Ramsey expresses worry that some of the kids aren't back yet but Mr. Ramsey glosses over her fears. The two of them reach a place where the lighthouse can be seen again. Mrs. Ramsey doesn't look. Mr. Ramsey looks at everything and murmurs, poor little universe, just who does this guy think he is? Mrs. Ramsey thinks his little um, phrases are ridiculous and that it's a perfectly fine evening. Then she brings up the idea that Mr. Ramsey would have written better books had he not married her. He says that he's not complaining and then kisses her hand passionately. Um, the two of them walk up the path and Mrs. Ramsey reflects that even though her husband is over 60, his arm feels just like a young man a young man's arm. 
Mrs. Ramsley contemplates her husband's inability to understand the simple and the ordinary in favor of dealing with the complex and the extraordinary. Mr. Ramsey shouts at a woman named Mrs. Mrs. Giddings. Mrs. Ramsey is not sympathetic to Mrs. Giddings and instead bends down to examine her evening promises. Mr. Ramsey makes some com comment about the flowers to please his wife. Mrs. Ramsey looks at Lily Briscoe and William Banks walking along, deciding in her head that the two of them must marry. And chapter 13 starts here. Mr. Banks and Lily are talking about travel. Lily is arrested by the sight of Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey watching a girl throw a ball and this vision is enriched, en enshrined for her as marriage. As Mrs. Ramsey turns and smiles at the couple, Lily realizes that Mrs. Ramsey wants her and William Banks to marry. Very intelligent girl, I must say. Mrs. Ramsey expresses pleasures. Uh, that uh, Mr. Banks will be joining them for dinner. Prue runs into them and Mrs. Ramsey asks her if Nancy was with the still missing group of her children. This entire chapter basically takes place within parenthesis and there are parenthesis within parenthesis which we will analyze later. Just note them um, for now and say what a weird style of writing. Well, um, and we are, we, we are in Nancy's viewpoint now. She went reluctantly with the other after Minta gave her a pleading look. Nancy and Minta hold hands. More accurately, Minta keeps reaching for Nancy's hand. Nancy is understandably confused. What the heck does Minta want? And we find that Andrew notes that Minta wears sensible clothes. Thereafter, he states that she wore short skirts. And before you ask, we are analyzing that later. Uh, Minta is sensible about everything except bulls. For some reason, she reacts to them the same way most women react to, the, to mice. Minta sits on the edge of a cliff and sings the song, Damn Your Eyes. Everyone else joins in. Then, in case you forget, Paul, Minta, Nancy, and Andrew get to the beach. And this is the missing group. Andrew and Nancy, being like third and fourth wheels, um, head out in opposite directions as soon as they reach the beach in order to give the couple some privacy. Nancy settles down with a tide pool and imagines that the pool is a giant sea. All the little uh, minoves are, are, are ferocious sharks and that she is, um, there is no delicate way to put this, but God. She plays with giving them life and death, light and dark, etc. And sits there and broods. Actually, she's just thinking, but with a side of sulking, throwing in. Andrew yells that the tide is coming in and Nancy runs away from the sea right into Paul and Minta getting their Mac on. Andrew and Nancy get really awkward as they put their socks and shoes on. As they get ready to walk back, Minta freaks out because she lost her grandmother's brooch. Everyone helps her look for it, but the tide is rising. Nancy gets the sense that Minta is crying for more than just the loss of the brooch. They mark the place where Minta was sitting. And Paul silently swears to wake up early tomorrow and go look for it. This episode is basically all about Benta and Paul's relationship or relationship to be. Paul brags to Minta that he's so good at finding lost items. So indirectly telling her that she shouldn't worry and he'll be finding her brooch very soon, probably early in the morning. Paul and Minta walk ahead of Nancy and Andrew and Paul can't wait to find Mrs. Ramsey and tell her everything. Asking Minta to marry him was to paraphrase the worst moment ever and Paul sort of kind of and basically blames Mrs. Ramsey for making him do it. 
They get to the house which is little lit up for dinner and Paul silently determines not to make a fool of himself. And here the parenthesis end in the end of the chapter and the whole chapter goes on inside parenthesis inside parenthesis. And in chapter 15, this is quite comparatively a very short chapter where you will find Prue tells her mother that Nancy did go with the others. And the whole chapter goes into the same thing. In chapter 16, however, you will find that Jasper and Rose come into Mrs. Ramsey's room as she's getting ready for dinner, asking if dinner should be postponed until the missing members return. Mrs. Ramsey um, mindful that 15 will be sitting down to dinner tells Jasper to tell the cook not to put dinner on hold. Rose receives permission to pick out the jewels her mother will wear at dinner. Mrs. Ramsey is annoyed that the missing four are late because she wants tonight's dinner to be especially very nice. William Banks had finally agreed to eat with them and the cook will be serving a magnificent boff in a daub. Uh, Mrs. Ramsey wants everything to be precise and perfect. Her children, now that Jasper has joined them, offer necklace to try against her dress. Mrs. Ramsey looks out the window absentmindedly uh, and watches some rocks birds trying to decide where to settle down. She has named one of the old birds Joseph. The birds start fighting and then leave. Mrs. Ramsey deliberately um, lets Rose take her time in choosing the necklace she is to wear. After also choosing a shawl, all the preparations are finally over and Mrs. Ramsey descends to dinner with Jasper and Rose. Jasper is talking to Mr. Mrs. Ramsey about the birds when Mrs. Ramsey is distracted by some commotion in the hall and she's eager to find out if Paul and Minta are now engaged but knows she'll have to wait. She descends the staircase and is compared to a queen accepting tribute from her people. Yes, she is apparently that beautiful. Anyway, Mrs. Ramsey smells something burning and worries that it's the it's her special dish, and she um, and the dinner gong uh, sounds apparently just yelling dinner doesn't work for these people, and everyone drops what they are doing and heads to the dinner table to have that special dinner of that evening. And chapter 17 starts. So um, in chapter six, 17, let's take a moment and establish who is the 15, 15 of these people who are um, doing this dinner. Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey, the eight Ramsey, Ramsey kids, Minta, Paul, Paul Augustus, um, Augustus Carmichael, Lily William, and the odious little Charles Tansley. After a brief moment spent questioning what she is accomplished with her life, Mrs. Ramsey organizes the seating, the food, etc. As she ladles out soap, Mrs. Ramsey feels a discord over the shabbiness of her surroundings and the separation of her guest. She feels in her soul duty uh, it her sole duty to create beauty and harmony. Mrs. Ramsey engages William Banks in conversation. Lily Briscoe watches Mrs. Ramsey, noticing that she looks old and tired until she begins talking to Mr. Banks, at which point Mrs. Ramsey brightens up. And this change of behavior and physical change so clearly highlighted by Virginia Woolf is again a question mark following the discussion. It's clear that Mrs. Ramsey pities William Banks, according to Lily. Mrs. Ramsey doesn't pity William because he is pitiful, but because Mrs. Ramsey wants him to be pitiful. Heck. 
needs him to be pitiful even. So it's a controversy whether he is that or she wants him to be that. Lily thinks of her paintings and realizes that she should put a tree in the middle of it. She moves the salt shaker on the table in front of her to remind herself of that intention later. And there's a little pot of um, salt uh, with a little tiny spoon inside that she all the time she's moving and somehow she um, associates her thoughts rather or more precisely her plans and intentions with the move she makes of that salt shaker. Um, and you will watch this in video and you'll be able to see. Listening to Mrs. Ramsey and Mr. Banks talk about letters, Mr. Tansley is irritated. Mrs. Ramsey takes pity on Mr. Tansley and tries to draw him into the conversation. Lily observes that Mrs. Ramsey allows pity's men but never women. Mr. Tensley is bothered by this superficial conversation. He had been reading presumably something so very important and so very deep before coming down to dinner and now being on dinner, being indulged in this trivial useless talk, he really feels bothered. He's also embarrassed um, that everyone is dressed nicely and he's just wearing the same old clothes he has been wearing all day. Mr. Tansley then thinks uh, m mean thoughts about women being superficial and silly, mean men. Um, to assert himself and his uh, manliness, he returns to the impossibility of a trip to the lighthouse tomorrow. If he thinks this makes him attractive to Mrs. Ramsey, he's definitely wrong. So pointing out at something that Mrs. Ramsey being women is not able to make possible, he wants to show his manliness by diverting people's attention towards that very particular thing. Now we find that Lily Briscoe is annoyed at Mr. Tansley and thinks mean thoughts about him, including that he is the most uncharming human being she had ever met. She tries to think about her painting in an effort to control her temper. Lily sweetly asks if she can join Mr. Tansley on the lighthouse trip and Mr. Tansley can see that she obviously doesn't mean a word of it and answers her like a jerk, you'd be sick. And we see that both of these characters do not really um, absorb each other. Then we have a para, para, paragraph designed to put us in Mr. Tansley's shoes and feel sorry for the guy. He's wear, wearing old flannel trousers. He didn't mean to sound like a jerk with Mrs. Ramsey listening. He may have crappy clothes, but he's never been in debt. He's even helping his family financially and educating his sister um, and so on and so forth. Well, sure, we are feeling a bit more sympathetic now by listening to Mr. Tensley's uh, imaginative monologue. Now, Mrs. Ramsey is now talking to Mr. Banks about an old friend of hers named Carrie. Mrs. Ramsey feels very uncomfortable that Carrie has gone off and had her own life and Mrs. Ramsey hasn't given her a single thought over the years. Mr. Banks feels superior because he never loses touch with friends. Maybe it's because he doesn't have many to keep in touch with. Mrs. Ramsey breaks off their conversation to talk to the maid and Mr. Banks uh, is irritated. He regrets he stayed for dinner in the first place um, when Mrs. Ramsey turns back to him. Mr. Banks doesn't really want to talk but he's afraid Mrs. Ramsey will realize that he doesn't give a rat's behind about her. So he continues chatting with her. 
We find Mr. Tansley daydreaming that he is bragging to his female acquaintances about staying with the famous Ramses and how they failed to impress him at all. Mr. Tansley again feels uncomfortable and looks around the table in the hopes that someone will give him an opportunity to be a jerk again. Lily can see all this and is observing very keenly and knows that social convention deems that she makes conversation with the man. But remembering his nasty comments about women's inability to paint and write, uh, Lily leaves Mr. Tansley to struggle. Alone, Mrs. Ramsey asks Mr. Tansley if he is a good sailor and Mr. Tansley gets ready to assert something and show how admirable he is or a man is. But he realizes how it would be um, ludicrous and simply says that he never gets seasick. Which doesn't really seem like an answer to her question. But we do learn that he has a major chip on his shoulder about having raised himself up by his own boot straps. Mrs. Ramsey basically looks at Lily and telepathically tells her to take social pity on the poor, awkward being Mr. Tansley. And she should come forward to help him. Lily proceeds to have a completely insincere conversation with Mr. Tansley, which Lily reflects is characteristic of all human interactions. She is cheered by the thought of painting tomorrow. So, conversation continues largely about fishermen and their wages, but everyone feels that something is lacking. There is no harmony among the group. Mrs. Ramsey looks down the table at her husband, expecting him to be magnificently holding forth about fishermen and their wages. But he is instead looking very angry that Augustus Carmichael has asked for another bowl of soup. Mrs. Ramsey knows that her husband hates it when people continue eating after he's finished. Then the married couple sitting at opposite ends of the table have a little mental argument. And Mrs. Ramsey realizing that Nancy, are Roger, Nancy and Roger are about to laugh at their father calls for the candles to be lit. Mrs. Ramsey reflects that Mr. Augustus never follows social norms. He does stuff like asking for more soup, takes a liking licking to Andrew and lies on the lawn thinking of his poetry for Mr. Augustus is a poet. Eight candles are lit along the table and everyone stares at um, rose fruit arrangement. They are united in that stare. Minta and Paul finally come into dinner. Minta fumbles to explain their lateness. Mr. Ramsey teases Minta telling her it was foolish to take jewelry to the beach. That's what their relationship is like in a nutshell. Minta giggles and flirts and Mr. Ramsey calls her a fool. Moreover, Minta, Minta's got it going on tonight. She knows it too, which is why she smiles a wide grin. Mrs. Ramsey sees the grin and assumes that Minta has gotten engaged to Paul rarely. For a split Second, Mrs. Mrs. Ramsey is unexpectedly jealous. She flashes back to her own engagement to her husband. Um, the dinner is set on the table as Paul sits down next to Mrs. Ramsey. She asks him to tell her what had happened. The first word out of Paul's mouth is V and Mrs. Ramsey can immediately tell that he and Minta are engaged. How forcefully pronouns are used to mark realities by Virginia Woolf is one of her characteristics of writing, obviously. Um, the special uh, French dish 
Bof and Dope. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it the way it has to be, but it is unveiled and it is a triumph. Mrs. Ramsey says that it is a French recipe of a grandmother and everyone talks about the, the culinary arts for a while. Mrs. Ramsey talks about vegetable skins and we see that a discussion or a kind of um, comparison is brought in, um, in f um, between French and English um, taking the medium of food and we find that people are talking about whether French or English and um, um, Mr. Ram Ms. Ramsey tends to finish the conversation by, by saying that it was only food that she, she was referring to because um, by saying that we English tend to overcook vegetables. How Virginia is using this platform to bring in the comparison between French and English is another thought-provoking um, question. Lily sees everyone silently worshipping Mrs. Ramsey. Lily sees everyone silently worshipping Mr. Ramsey and, and wonders that um, why is everyone um, feel so wonderfully rescued and offers to help Paul look for Minta's brooch tomorrow morning. Paul doesn't say yes or no. It's obvious that he just doesn't care about anything other than his lover at that moment. Lily feels upset, then sees the salt shaker and remembers that she will, point to, she will paint tomorrow and that she doesn't have to marry. Apparently, the two are connected. Lily feels that staying with the Ramses causes her to feel two violently opposite emotions at the same time. And she feels ambivalent. On the one hand, that love is wonderful. But on the other hand, it's childish beyond belief. Mrs. Ramsay goes on and on about the British uh, dairy system. Everyone laughs at her. Mrs. Ramsay looks at Lily and Mr. Tensley, concluding that both of them suffer in the presence of the happy Paul and Minta Doyle. Mr. Tensley obviously looks like he feels left out because no woman is going to give him a second glance with Paul in the room. And Lily just seems faded and inconspicuous next to Minta's beautiful glow. Mrs. Ramsey does believe, however, that if you compare Lily and Minta at 40, Lily will be the fairer of the two. She has an, an indefiable something that Mrs. Ramsey likes but is afraid no man will like. This sets her thinking about how to get Lily and Mr. Banks together. Mrs. Ramsey gives Mr. Banks more of that French dish. Mr. Tensley continues being egotistical, and Mrs. Ramsey reflects that he will probably continue being that way until he becomes a professor or eventually get married. Mrs. Ramsey turns uh, and tunes into the conversation about numbers and philosophers and monitors for that matter for topics that could potentially upset her husband and makes him think about his failures. Um, this is very um, in interesting that Minta Doyle staves off a potential tantrum by Mr. Ramsey making some insane, uh, inane comment about, insane comment about Shakespeare. Paul Raleigh tries to talk about Anna Karenina. He likes the name um, Vronsky for a villain. Um, Paul asks if she wants a peer. Mrs. Ramsey says no and then realizes she's been gardening the fruit basket jealously, hoping no one would disturb it. And we find Mrs. Ramsey looking at Prue and sees that Prue has caught some of Minta's beauty of being in love. Dinner is over, but Mr. Ramsey is telling Minta some absurd story that is not finishing. Mrs. Ramsey determines to wait until everyone is done laughing. She decides she likes Charles Tensley. One story leads to another. Mrs. Ramsey waits patiently. 
Mr. Ramsey and some of the other guests start reciting poetry. Mrs. Ramsey gets up and leaves, looking once over her shoulder to confirm that the dinner has already become part of the past. And here we are going to start the second last chapter where story is reaching its almost its end. As though Mrs. Ramsey's departure is a signal, everyone gets up and scatters in different directions. As Mrs. Ramsey was the focal point of keeping everyone together. Um, as she walks off, she, uh, she is fused with a sense of her own place in the stream of time. She goes into her children's room and, and is irritated to find that James and Cam are still awake. A big skull has been nailed to the wall. Cam can't sleep with it there and James gets mad if any, anyone touches it. Mrs. Ramsey finally very wisely dealt with the psychology of both the children and she covers the skull on the wall telling Cam that she can, she can imagine this to be a kind of um, uh, an object that can take her into beautiful imaginations and at the same time telling James that the skull is still on the wall. So, um, she is basically dealing with both of them and eventually satisfied and find them satisfied. Mrs. Ramsey then turns her attention to James, who asks if they are going to the lighthouse tomorrow. Poor James. Mrs. Ramsey says no, but that they will go on the next time. The weather is good. Mrs. Ramsey leaves the room and encounters Prue, Minta and Paul. Prue looks at her mother and feels very proud. She says they are thinking of going to the beach to watch the waves. Mrs. Ramsey suddenly turns into a giggling teenager. She tells them to go after making sure they have a watch. They do indeed have a watch, a beautiful one belonging to Paul. Mrs. Ramsey expresses a wish to go with them, but something holds her back. She goes into a room where her husband is reading. And here the story is about to finish when we find Mrs. Ramsey continues to knit the stocking as she watches her husband read. She's troubled because she knows her husband is stressed about the legacy his books will leave behind. As she knits, Mrs. Ramsey murmurs snippets of the poem they had been reciting at dinner. Finally, she opens a book and begins to read it without really absorbing the words. Mr. Ramsey is pleased. He feels like he's triumphant over an, an unseen adversary. Mrs. Ramsey continues to read until she becomes aware that her husband is watching her. To him, she's more beautiful than ever, but he's also thinking about how she's ignorant and less educated than he is, though he likes that too, because this is why he could determine his, um, his superiority over his wife. Mrs. Ramsey continues knitting as she searches for something to say and finally she tells her husband that Paul and Minta are engaged. The two of them make awkward conversation. Mr. Ramsey, Ramsey continues to look at Mrs. Ramsey but Mrs. Ramsey feels the look change. He wants her to tell him that she loves him. Mrs. Ramsey can't do it. She says she has a hard time saying what she feels. She tries to figure out if there is something else she can do for him, like brush his coat, but there is nothing. She gets up and looks at the sea. Finally, she turns around and just smiles at him. And when she smiles, she is certain that he knows that she loves him. She tells him that he was right. They won't be able to go to the lighthouse tomorrow. She wins. And that was all about the, the um, chapter by chapter discussion we had to do. Now we are going to get into the discussion 
regarding characters. And how I will start it, I will try to give you a uh, precise um, description of each one of these characters. However, we will get into the detailed analysis of some of them, only the major characters. So, the very first character we will be talking about is Mrs. Ramsey. She's Mrs. Mr. Ramsey's wife, a beautiful and loving woman. Mrs. Ramsey is a wonderful hostess who takes pride in making memorable experiences for the guests at the family summer home on the Isle of Skye. Affirming traditional gender roles wholeheartedly, she lavishes particular attention on her male guests who she believes have delicate egos and need constant support and sympathy. She is a dutiful and loving wife, um, but often struggles with her husband's difficult moods and selfishness. Without fail, however, she triumphs through these difficult times and demonstrates an ability to make something significant and lasting from the most um, ephemeral of circumstances such as dinner party. And we find um, Mr. Ramsey uh, lit altogether um, a different character from Mrs. Ramsey. Um, they both are husband wife and a prominent metaphysical philosopher Mr. Ramsey is. He loves his family but often acts like something of a, of a tyrant a kind of stubborn person who would like everyone to follow his wish. He tends to be selfish most of the time and harsh due to his persistent personal and professional anxieties. He fears more than anything that his work is insignificant in the grand scheme of things and that he will not be remembered by future generations. Well aware of how blessed he is to have such a wonderful family, he nevertheless tends to punish his wife, children and guests by demanding their constant sympathy, attention and support. And we have Lily Briscoe, another beautiful character. A young single painter who, who befriends the Ramses on the Isle of Skye. Like Mr. Ramsey, Lily is 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 um, plugged by fears that her work lacks worth. She begins a portrait of Mrs. Ramsey at the beginning of the novel, but she has trouble finishing it. The opinions of men like Charles Tansley, who insist that women cannot paint or do anything worthwhile or right, as a matter of fact, threaten to undermine her confidence all the time. James Ramsey, the Ramsey's youngest son, is another beautiful character. James loves his mother deeply and feels a, a murderous um, antipathy toward his father because of his harsh and, and irritating attitude, with whom he must compete for Mrs. Ramsey's love and affection. At the beginning of the novel, Mr. Ramsey refuses the six years old James' request to go to the lighthouse, saying that the weather will be foul and not permit it. Ten years later, when James turns 16, the family finally makes the journey with his father and his sister Cam. By this time, he has grown into a willful and moody young man who has much in common with his father, whom he tests. And we have Paul Raleigh, a young friend of the Ramses who visits them on the Isle of Skye. Paul is a kind, impressionable young man who follows Mrs. Ramses' wishes in marrying Minta Doyle. Minta is a, is a, a flightly young woman who visits the Ramsay on the Isle of Skye and she marries Paul at Mrs. Ramses' wishes. Charles Tensley, a young philosopher and pupil of Mrs. Ramsey, who stays with the Ramses on the um, place in the village. Tensley is a, is a prickly and unpleasant man who harbors deep insecurities regarding his humble background. He often insults other people, particularly women as such as Lily, whose talent and accomplishments he constantly calls into question. 
his bad behavior like Mr. Rimsey's is motivated by his need for reassurance. And um, William Blanks is a botanist and old friend of the family who stays on the uh, place during summers with them. Banks is a kind and mellow man whom Mrs. Ramsey hopes will marry Lily someday. Although he never marries her, Banks and Lily remain close friends. Augustus Carmichael, an opi opium using poet who visits the Ramsey on the Isle of Skye, Carmichael um, luggish, luggishes in literary obscurity until his Worse becomes popular during the war. Andrew, the oldest of the Ramsay's son. Andrew is a competent, independent young man and he looks forward to a career as a mathematician. Jasper Ramsay, one of the Ramsay's son, Jasper to his mother's um, ch chagrin enjoys shooting birds. Roger is another son who is wild and adventurous and like his sister Nancy. Prue, the oldest Ramsay girl, a beautiful young woman. Mrs. Ramsay delights in contemplating Prue's marriage, which she believes will be blissful. Rose Ramsay, one of the Ramsay's daughters. Rose has a talent for making things beautiful. She arranges the fruit for her mother's dinner party and picks out her mother's jewelry. Nancy, one of the Ramses' daughters, um, who accomplishes Paul and Minta on their trip to the, to the beach, who accompanies this trip and, like her brother Roger, she is a wild adventurer. Cam is another daughter, is a young girl who is mischievous in nature and she sails with James and Mr. Ramsey to the lighthouse in the novel's final section. Mr. McNabb is uh, a minor character, an elderly woman who takes care of the Ramsey's house on the Isle of Skye, restoring it after 10 years of abandonment during, the, during and after World War I. And McAllister, the fisherman who accompanies the Ramses to the lighthouse eventually in the last section, McAllister relates stories of shipwreck and, and, marit and maritime adventure to Mr. Ramsey and, com and compliments James on his handling of the boat while James lands it at the lighthouse. And McAllister's boy is a fisherman's boy. He rose James came and Mr. Ramsey to the lighthouse. And apparently it looks like the same boy for whom Mrs. Ramsey will knit all the time. So this brings us to um, the discussion, the detailed discussion regarding the major characters. And we will start our uh, analysis with Mrs. Ramsey's character. Mrs. Ramsay is about as close as Virginia Woolf ever got to Angelina Jolie. Mrs. Ramsay is beautiful, beloved, um, charitable, and the mother of many children. Although Mr. Ramsay is no Brad Pitt, but that's about as far as the similarities go. Mrs. Ramsay isn't a UN ambassador, and we very um, much doubt that she gave birth to, say, James Ramsay in in uh, Namibia, Namibia as Judy did with um, Shiro. But the point remains the same. Mrs. Ramsey is a lovely star at the center of the Ramsey's family and at the heart of the novel. Her unexpected death leaves the Ramsey family and especially Mr. Ramsey without its anchor. Mrs. Ramsey is a complex character. She is invested in the importance of marriage between a man and a woman. And all men and all women should definitely be married according to her. But she clearly sees the flaws in her own marriage. It becomes Mrs. Ramsey's duty to soften her husband's bullying and to support him in public. Even so, she is embarrassed by his constant quoting of poetry in a loud voice and by his need for praise from the people around him. She would always defend him. In the midst of all of Ms. Mr. Ramsey's 
posturing and performing, he's actually insecure. And it falls to Mrs. Ramsey to soothe those insecurities because that's what she perceives to be the job of the wife. Well, at the end of the part one, we see a clear vision of labor between Mrs. Ramsey and Mr. Ramsey. He found talking much easier than she did, but she felt herself very beautiful. He's the one who talks. He's the intellectual one. But she's the one who attracts people and who makes social interaction possible, at least in part because she is beautiful. These are the roles they are. Uh, they, they are each relatively comfortable playing. Mr. Ramsey gets to be the brains if Mrs. Ramsey gets to be the beauty. The weird thing is though that neither of them are completely successful in their gender roles. Mrs. Ramsey loves the flattery of being checked out by the men around her, but she uses this admiration to influence Paul Raleigh to marry Minta, a marriage that Lily Briscoe reveals in the third chapter is a complete disaster. Mrs. Ramsey's investment in her traditional gender role as a mother and matchmaker actually damages the people around her. And Mr. Mr. Ramsey spends much of the first chapter um, secretly wondering why he can't compete or complete the line of logical reasoning that would prove that he is really a genius. Those around him, William Banks, Charles Tensley, and even Mrs. Ramsey, think to themselves that his last book was perhaps not his best book. The effort of trying to be the intellectual head of both his family uh, with, the, with the rebellious James and of his social circle with the ever striving Charles Tensley um, eats away at him inside. The thing that's interesting about Mrs. Ramsey and her partnership with Mr. Ramsey is that Mr. Ramsey is obviously the oppressive um, Pat Patrick, but Mrs. Ramsey is pretty darn oppressive too um, in a much subtle way. She's got this total love-hate thing going with Lily Briscoe, who adores Mrs. Ramsey, but who feels, who also feels that by being beautiful and completely stubborn, Mrs. Ramsey makes people do things that they wouldn't otherwise do. But it's the terrible marriage between Paul and Minta. But beauty was not everything. Beauty had his, this penalty. It comes to readily, come to completely. It still life froze it. One forget to li the little uh, agitations, the flush, the pallor, some queer distortion, some light or shadow, which made the face unrecognizable for a moment and yet added a quality one saw for ever after. It was simpler to smooth that all out under the cover of beauty. The criticism that Lily's offering her here of Mrs. Ramsey is this, she was great at pulling together her family. But by doing so, she smoothed over all of the complexities and individual interest of her children and her friends in favor of a greater whole. Mrs. Ramsey is an overt bully, but Mrs. Ramsey quietly influences people to take the shape that she wants them to take. In the same in the name of the greater ideal beauty that Mrs. Ramsey is pursuing. For more on Lily's love, hate, thing, um, we can uh, do the character uh, roles section for Lily. So moving on with Mr. Mrs. Ramsey and men, specifically Mr. Ramsey, we are going to discuss the relationship as husband-wife as well as the, the relationship of a woman towards a man of uh, his attention, uh, her attention rather. Mrs. Ramsey thrives on male companionship because she sets herself up as a kind of superwoman. She gives great dinner parties and she raises eight children, yet she still has the energy to be effortlessly beautiful. 
and what better way is there to show off her um, womanhood than to be surrounded by men? The thing is, though when we talk about the symbol of the lighthouse and symbols, imagery, allegory, we mentioned that one of the themes of this book is the gap between the ideal and the real. The gap between the reality and the fantasies. And there's definitely a gap here. Mrs. Ramsey works so hard to be a perfect wife that it freaks her out when Mr. Ramsey can't, can't quite fill the role of perfect husband and father. She did not like even for a second to feel finer than her husband and further could not bear not being entirely sure when she spoke to him of the truth of what she said that Mr. Ramsey is not a failure. Universities and people wanting him lectures and books and their being of the highest importance. All that she did not doubt for a moment, but it was their relation. And is coming to her like that, openly, so that anyone could see that this composed her, for then people said he depended on her, when they must know that of the two he was infinitely the more important and what she gave the world in comparison with what he gave, negligible. There are two things about Mr. Ramsey that are worrying Mrs. Ramsey in, in this passage. The first is that he comes to her directly and announces that he is a failure, quite openly. So he's exposing his weakness to her in the showiest, most ostentatious way possible. For Mrs. Ramsey, it's as though he suddenly strolled into the drawing room completely off um, scene. The whole point of her, of, men, of menhood, is that it's all about hiding its weakness. Some likes men for their um, chivalry and valor, for the fact that they negotiated uh, treaties, ruled India, controlled finances, so on and so forth. 